Okay, so we start today uh, with the first part of the course uh, and uh, in the lecture that I present to you now we will be uh, demonstrating uh, how physics arises in a biological system and what kind of uh, physics concepts are necessary to understand and describe uh, the biological processes that are governed by the physics. And um, the first example is, so to speak, um, uh, particularly true physics, namely quantum physics. Uh, so I might uh, add quickly that um, this is a uh, graduate course in physics here. Uh, I know that some of the, um, the people in the audience who want to take the course are not physicists, uh, but you know this is a physics uh, um, a graduate course, so we cannot change that. On the other side, I'm not trying to make it more difficult than necessary. So if you have a background as a um, biologist or by engineers in undergraduate physics, then a reasonable background, I don't want to say excellent, reasonable, you can uh, do well. But if you don't have the background, you might have a problem. You cannot come to the physics department and take a graduate course and think there is no physics there. Okay, so um, you will see that now. This is a really poor. Uh, okay, well, nothing we can do about it. So the resolution is a little bad. Maybe next time we can choose it a little better. But let's begin. I turn down the light a little bit more. Uh, we have to here somewhere. And okay, only there. Okay, try to maybe. Okay, yeah, this is better. So in that. Okay, so here we have a, um, an, uh, an uh, biological process, something that is extremely important, namely how uh, a life form on Earth uh, gathers energy. Uh, we all need energy, we have an energy problem as human, and of course uh, life, uh, uh, biological life on Earth had to solve the energy problem and you know pretty well how this is done namely life uses uh, the energy of the sun now we are not doing this directly we eat plants or we eat animals that eat plants uh, but uh, ultimately uh, by far the, the largest amount of energy that is utilized um, uh, in the biosphere of Earth comes from solar energy. I think it's sort of estimated about 95%, maybe more than that. So um, energy is also an extremely uh, important resource for um, life forms. You know, they compete with each other and there is a tremendous uh, uh, competition going on, for example, in photosynthetic life forms that gather the sun's energy directly for this energy. But uh, other life forms that utilize indirectly the solar energy by eating, for example, plants, they have likewise a tremendous amount of competition to get as much energy out of, uh, 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 as possible out of the energy sources. And so the same is true in, um, in, uh, uh, on Earth in photosynthetic life forms. Um, now we know who the winners are. The winners are uh, plants. They uh, have the real estate closest to the sun, and they are uh, you know, all over the, the, the earth. But there are of course other life forms, the algae in the water, they also do pretty well. Um, but uh, there are also bacteria, photosynthetic bacteria. They are single cell uh, species and uh, they are not so visible to the eye. They also uh, don't do quite so well. There are actually many uh, special forms of bacteria that only exist in particular niches where no plant wants to go because there is not enough light coming there. 
And uh, we look at one of those uh, photosynthetic life forms called purple bacteria that uh, live actually at the bottom of ponds where the solar spectrum is harvested uh, very much by the other photosynthetic life forms, by the algae in the water and by the uh, plants above the water. Uh, so that they have to live with very few photons, and mainly photons around 800 and 500 nanometer. The reason why we study this um, poor uh, uh, cousin <coughs> of uh, biological photosynthesis is the famous um, uh, uh, strategy in physics, namely when you want to study a system, you look for the simplest incarnation. So we always talk about in physics uh, of the hydrogen atom that teaches so much quantum physics, uh, to solid state physicists, uh, biophysicists, uh, even to uh, elementary particle physicists, you name it. And so in a way the hydrogen atom of photosynthesis is this bacterium. If I would start right away with plants, then um, that would be in a way more relevant because uh, we are uh, confronted with them more often, but uh, it, their systems are more complex. And so in the classroom it's much better to talk about uh, these purple bacteria. Now uh, photosynthesis was invented pretty early on in, uh, 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 for life on Earth, namely about three billion years ago. And it turns out that the rudimentary mechanisms that are utilized are actually the same today by most species. So if we understand uh, the photosynthesis of, of uh, purple bacteria, then uh, we understand a lot of other photosynthesis as well. So the other photosynthesis is just more, in a way, more complicated, more involved, but uh, it is not uh, different so that uh, you if you know this kind of photosynthesis, you have to completely relearn the textbook to understand plant photosynthesis. So in this regard, it's, uh, it's not a bad hydrogen atom. It's something that's relevant uh, for photosynthesis on Earth. And so there we have this, um, this bacterium. It's shown there in green, but it's a false color. This is an, uh, an electromicrograph of the bacterium. And you see inside the bacterium these little roundish uh, 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 things. And that is, uh, both are uh, called photosynthetic chromatophores. And, uh, and that is actually where the photosynthesis in these cells take place. You see here a picture of them. And you will see this picture many, many times uh, today. And so I will just go over it now. But you see there uh, that there are actually hundreds of these uh, spherical particles in the cell that are, one calls them organelles, cellular organelles, that carry out a complete function, namely the light harvesting and turning the, the light energy into chemical fuel that drives cellular processes. So now let's, uh, let's uh, see what these uh, uh, processes are. And uh, this is a little bit complicated, and uh, we will unravel it later. So this is more now that you're getting an idea what is going on, so that you have a guidance. Mm -hmm. So let's say we, we want to go on a trip to Europe, to, to Paris, to London, to Paris, to Madrid and to Rome, and now I give you a little overview of our trip. And so this is what this is. So it all begins naturally with that light is absorbed, and uh, there are um, proteins that we will show in the following in green that, um, that are circular proteins, interestingly. We will see a little bit why they are circular later. And, uh, and they contain lots of chlorophylls. In one of these chromatophores, they contain 4, 000, about 4,000 <coughs> molecules of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll, you probably know, uh, those are the, um, uh, the, the um, molecules that make uh, plants green, because uh, they absorb every, every light except green, and so that's why the plant looks green. That's the only light they don't absorb. 
Now there are some other molecules too. Uh, they are called carotenoids that help the chlorophylls by filling out the space, the spectral space that the chlorophylls don't absorb from the sun. And the carotenoids are famous uh, for the color of carrots, the color of flamingos. We have actually an, a kind of carotenoid, a shorter version in our eyes for, for vision. And so uh, the team of about 1,000 uh, carotenoids and 4,000 chlorophylls that uh, do the job. Okay, they absorb the, 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 the light energy individually, but then there is a series of processes that we will be looking at a little bit more that leads to the excitation to migrate to this protein that is shown here in red called the reaction center, RC. And this is now converting the energy into a new form of energy. So when the solar energy comes, it is converted <coughs> into electronic excitations of the chlorophylls. And uh, this excitation migrates through the system. And uh, it arrives then at the reaction center. And now this, ener this energy bottled up in the form of an electronic excitation is now turned into a new kind of energy form, namely into a membrane potential. So the sphere that we saw before, I see this is shown here flat, is actually curved like this. So this is the inside of the sphere, this is the outside of the sphere. And so now you are, you are, you are moving electrons from the, from the inside to the outside, and you charge then these spheres negative outside and positive inside, you add to this uh, shell of these spheres, a so-called membrane, a voltage. And that is, of course, a form of energy that we use every day uh, when we, when we uh, plug something into the socket of the wall to drive some human machinery. So now we have this, uh, this potential, but now this potential is not really bottled well because it's in the form of electrons. And electrons uh, can move very easily from place to place. They can tunnel even through space that's energetically not accessible. And so you cannot keep this, uh, this potential for a very long time. So you must convert it quickly uh, into another form of energy. And so first, um, the system traps the, the electrons actually on a molecule called quinone together with a proton. Then you make it into what is called the hydroquinone. You have then a Q with an electron and a proton. So you have a quinone with an H atom. Now, um, chemically, this is not a very stable compound. And so the system <coughs> actually waits here with this uh, quinone for a second electron to be charged, uh, to be charged through the membrane. Uh, with the energy of a second photon coming nearby. And so then you are turning a quinone into QH2, two electrons and two protons, and those you call then quinoles. And now the quinole moves to the protein called the BC1 complex, where the, where the opposite is being taking place. The electrons are being taken off. And, uh, and being shuttled back to the reaction center so that the reaction center can do this again and again and again. And uh, the protons are being put on the other side of the membrane. So the electrons are now back where they were to begin with, so their potential is not in form of an electron anymore. But it is now in the form of a proton gradient, and that's much more stable. Proton, protons can conduct a little, uh, can tunnel a little, but they are much better to bottle. In fact, you can bottle them for a long time, and our own body cells um, <coughs> bottle, um, bottle the protons, uh, the proton gradient for, um, for, 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 for rather long times. But if not infinitely long. So now you must get that proton energy also transformed. And the best form for long-term energy storage and also for utilization is a fuel molecule. And that fuel molecule is uh, ATP. ATP, the energy-rich version, it stands for adenos adenosine triphosphate, and it's made from adenosine diphosphate. 
two phosphates, a third phosphate is added that makes the molecule more, ener more energetic. And uh, that is done with, uh, with a device called the ATP synthase. And that ATP synthase now is the end of the story of uh, purple bacteria photosynthesis. Uh, you have now uh, turned the, the, the form of uh, solar energy into a chemical energy. Now this ATPase is actually uh, together actually with the BC1 complex, but particularly ATPase is actually very common in all cells, uh, in all living cells, including human cells. And, um, and so uh, we have it too. And you might wonder how much ATP our ATP synthase in our, in our body cell, cells make. And so if I, somebody wants to guess in how much we make, like you can use milligram, gram, a ton, whatever unit you want to choose. I'm gonna say like a mole per year. A mole per year? Yeah, a mole of ATP. Okay, year. much more. Are we, are we talking about single mitochondria? Or uh, in a single... Uh, wherever we make ATP, if, uh, wherever we make. A single, a single, uh, how you, how much ATP you are making in your body? Well, a single molecule of glucose, I think, breaks down into 36 ATPs. How many, how much ATP do you make in your body? Don't give me some theory and calculation. Just give me the final answer. Okay, you know? Uh, I'm not sure. Is it something like a quarter or a third of our body weight? That's our body weight our body weight. So we are constantly making ATP and use it and make it and use it. Now of course we don't explode, sometimes I look like I, but, uh, but not quite. So we use it immediately. But if you look how much uh, ATP in terms of gram is, 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 uh, is synthesized, it is our body weight. So you realize this is really important stuff. So what we learn here is uh, not, silly, not silly biology. Very relevant. Okay, so, uh, so these are the processes. And so what you see is that this biology is sort of a little bit like an engineer. It's not like, you know, we dilly-dally with one particular process, there are one protein. It's, a, it's many proteins that work together, realizing a series of processes. And that's the difference between, let's say, physics and chemistry and biology. Biology is much more in a way an engineering problem because you have to make a device that works that, that uses solar energy and gives you something you can use for real uh, whereas you know if a chemist would be interested in a particular reaction that goes on maybe somewhere here or a physicist would be interested in something that goes on with the light uh, no the biology has to do the whole thing you have to put the components together, bring the molecules together, build them into a structure, and has to make that structure and carry out a series of processes. And that is um, really the new view that you are uh, uh, learn about in this course, uh, where in the past, you know, in many of your other fields, you, you had to focus, which is of course very, very good, and we hopefully we don't do a bad job in piecing all these details together, but the togetherness is what is counting, and not the individual step. Okay, so then let's, uh, let's go on. And here we have a cell um, uh, that, uh, that contains this, this chromatophore. Here you see one of them. Just we filled it in. This is actually an, an, an electron micrograph done with ion B milling, a very thin slice, a two, 200 angstrom slice of a cell is being cut out and, uh, and, and uh, so that we can image well. And now we see the places where these chromatophores, so that is the name of them, are stored. We see that the cell is full of these chromatophores. So it has hundreds of them because the energy utilization, energy is very important. This, this bacterium lives in dark uh, areas, so they have to really utilize a lot of chlorophyll to be sure that they don't miss a photon that comes through the habitat. So, okay, so uh, 
So this is how it is at the cell level. And now let's look at this, um, at this particular uh, uh, chromatophore. And here we see the chromatophore enlarged. And uh, we see here the, the small proteins. And then we see a bigger protein with the reaction center inside. We see here something I call the BC1 complex here. And we see here the ATP synthase that we share with this system in our own body. And now the, 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 these proteins are, are floating in some kind of mass here, shown sort of like in gold, and those are lipids. So the mem biological membranes that, that divide the, the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell are made of lipids. In case of bacterial cell, we actually have two membranes one that is made of sugar that gives it a mechanical strength and protection and an inside cell that's made of lipids in our body we only have the inside cell we don't have the outside and um, and so they are made of lipids and also the interior membrane of the cell is made of lipids and so here's our sphere is actually made of lipids and in these lipids are embedded uh, the proteins and uh, in this case actually the lipids are minority the proteins take much more of the mass of the chromatophore, uh, about 80%, uh, maybe even a little more than 80%. So the lipids are fewer. So the lipids are sort of more, more, more boring. They're like the, 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 the bricks of the factory. And so we just take them away. And now we just see the chromatophore without uh, the lipids. And so now you see the individual proteins uh, that make that make this machinery, and you see here on the top there the the, the top bottom or the top right. You see those uh, reaction processes that are going on in this in this system. And so now we would like to have a closer view of all these processes that we have been discussing. So let's now uh, make take a little closer still view of this uh, of this system again the same system we see that we have mainly the small proteins they contain just the chlorophyll to absorb sunlight and that's of course key to the whole uh, energy conversion you must first capture the sunlight and then you do something with it so they are the majority but then we see the other components that i mentioned already but rather than belaboring them here, we are now following the processes that I mentioned already, and they start with the small proteins. And here we see these small proteins. They are, they are the ones that absorb the sunlight. And uh, actually, can we maybe, my, my TAs, next time bring a pointer that I have one, I somehow I don't own one. It would be nice if we bring it from Beckman. So, so here we have the here we have these these uh, the protein that absorb. And here you see the protein. They are circular, and uh, you see them here from the side, and here you see them from the top. And uh, also shown in there are the are the chlorophylls. Uh, here you see the chlorophylls, but so a little bit hard to see because they're also green. Here you see them a little better. And you see there is uh, one ring of chlorophylls here. Those are 18 chlorophylls, and then there is a loser ring on the, on the top. Those are uh, nine chlorophylls. And so you have uh, 18 chlorophylls plus nine chlorophylls, so nine plus nine plus nine. Why do you have three, three groups, nine plus nine plus nine? Because of x, y, and z axis. If you are these two here absorb best in the xy plane, light that is polarized in the xy plane, these ones absorb the rest of the light that is polarized in the z direction. So, you know, these, these uh, bacteria are, are smart cookies. So, you see here uh, how, how, how these things look like. Now, let's have a closer look of the of the, of the chlorophylls inside, and I mentioned already that the chlorophylls do not do the job alone. They are being assisted by carotenoids. Here you see the carotenoid. They are long, they are very long uh, uh, um, molecules, and the chlorophylls are circular molecules. And so, uh, so they work together. Uh, the, uh, uh, 
so that we do. Now, why do you have the two? I mentioned that already. The, they share uh, where they absorb sunlight. And if you look here, then you find that the carotenoids absorb the 500 nanometer photons that I told you is in the habitat of the of these bacteria, whereas the chlorophylls directly absorb the 800 nanometer photons. So they, so they have really very good, uh, very good uh, teamwork here in terms of what, what uh, part of the solar spectrum is being absorbed. So they complement each other. And now the, the, <coughs> the, the carotenoids are, the, uh, are the, 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 the nice guys in a way because they're the energy richer guys. They absorb shorter wavelengths light. So when they get a photon, they have more energy. And these are the poorer energy uh, lights. And so the carotenoids can give the excitation to the chlorophylls, but the other way around is not possible because you get energy uphill. So the, the chlorophylls, uh, the carotenoids absorb light and give it uh, light energy and give it immediately to the chlorophylls. Immediately. What do we mean by immediately? Immediately we mean. Uh, a time scale that is even immediate for a physicist. The time scale is 100 femtoseconds. 100 femtoseconds. So that is, uh, uh, you know, like uh, 10 to the minus 13 seconds. So that is almost getting to the, to not quite, but it's getting almost the nuclear physics time scales. Definitely, uh, if you tell um, a solid state physicist here, something about 100 femtoseconds, they're impressed. And they're, how do you measure this? Oh my god, this is real pure physics. Not biology, not just dirty biology. This is a physics guy. No, no, you tell them this is for the biology case, I say. Yes, these are well-tuned electronic systems that, that really use the best physics, the fastest physics, to be sure to capture, to capture energy. So within 100 femtoseconds, the excitation goes to the chlorophylls. And the real guys that do the main work are the ones in the bottom ring. And when these guys absorb light, they also give the energy to the bottom one. So these guys give to the bottom, the top guys also to the bottom. And uh, OK, so, so that is how it goes. So now we have the individual chlorophylls excited at the end. Then they excite the chlorophylls, the 18 chlorophylls in the bottom ring. And now, uh, oops. And now um, the question is, uh, why do they, why are they forming this ring? And now the answer here is that here we have for the first time, uh, 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 or here we have actually a second um, transfer conversion of energy. A little subtle one, but a very, very important one. So, so the, um, the, when solar energy comes, it's in the radiation. When it interacts with the electrons of the carotenoids or the chlorophyll, it becomes electronic excitation of the molecule. That's conversion one. But now we have the individual chlorophylls or carotenoids excited. When it goes to the ring, then these chlorophylls, they are very close together, and they like to share the excitation. So the excitation runs around the ring, just like the famous homework problem, particle on a ring that you solve in quantum mechanics, you know the excitation is coherently shared. You get in several energy levels, a bottom one, the next one, the next one, the next one, and so they share the excitation. And why do they do that? They do that for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is, the second reason I'll tell you a little later, in, in a minute or two, the first reason is that it turns out that the bottom electronic excitation has the energy, but it doesn't like to give it away. It's, so, it's called a forbidden excitation, meaning you cannot radiate it. It's like when you are in a hydrogen atom, maybe you know a little bit already about electronic transitions, you are in the, in the two S state. You cannot, ex you cannot get rid of the excitation through radiation because the transition 2s, 1s is optically forbidden. If you're in a 2p state, then you can go to the 1s state, no problem. But from the 2s state, you cannot. And so this one is, in a way, 
and, and, and symmetric state that is the same symmetry at the ground state and so bottles energy. Energy is, is uh, very nice there. Would of course be great if our plants outside there would fluoresce would look very nice, right? But not good for the plant. They want to keep the energy and not, uh, and not make, a, make a nice uh, laser show here. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that is one. So you see already that when we look closer, we are really getting physics, physics, physics all over the, all over the landscape. So now the, the excitation now goes from the small rings so the large rings, here we have again a ring, actually two rings, and those are these red molecules, they also have rings of chlorophylls. So they also are capable of excitation sharing, and uh, so they take the energy then from the small rings. So now we have another process, namely excitation energy transfer from the small rings to the big ring. And then the excitation jumps now to the reaction center where it is now turned into an electron-based voltage gradient, as I told you already. So green ring, chlor single chlorophylls absorb. They form then single, electron single electronic states of a chlorophyll, uh, energy form one. They share the electronic excitation term of the delocalized electron. Uh, excitation energy form two jumps to the red one and then jumps to the blue one. And the blue one excites chlorophylls and there's a pair of chlorophyll that is suspiciously close together, like they really hug each other, and, uh, and they are taking the excitation. And they can turn the excitation now into electron transfer. You, you, this one is not a stereo view, and we look at it in more detail later, but they are capable now of, excite, of, of conducting an electron to the top, driven by the electronic excitation energy. Just like what you also have in a solar cell, um, you, you put in electronic excitation, getting out the voltage in terms of electron uh, uh, potential, and here we are doing the same, electron is being conducted to the top. So this is now the third form of excitation. Now we have the electron voltage there. And so this is, of course, a key step. There we have really now a totally different kind of excitation, namely a voltage gradient. And now we look at the whole system a little bit together again. Our green molecules that absorb initially the excitation. And then the, the big ring molecule, the red ones, and the reaction center that turn it into electron gradient. And now here we see those rings of chlorophylls, a ring of chlorophyll, the ring of chlorophylls, here in red, the chlorophylls. By the way, you're getting this, uh, this as a PDF file, and there's some nice text there. And so you, uh, you have those, these slides will be on the website. Uh, and I, I, uh, I, I mentioned the website at the end of our class today. So, so, so okay, so, so, so now I can tell you a second reason why this why these, uh, sh excitation is shared. It's a pretty good picture, even though it sounds almost silly, that you can, you can equate this excitation sharing to, uh, to, to people, every chlorophyll is a person, who shout each other messages, like, I have energy, <coughs> do you want to have it? And, uh, and you know, they shout and they can reach uh, another chlorophyll that said, yes, give it to me, and then the excitation goes. But uh, their voices are not very, uh, very loud, and so uh, it's like, like maybe a little girl, little girl schools, and they just have whisper voices, and so they don't carry far. Now, if you want to carry the excitation further, for example, all the way from here to there, and then over to here, and then to here, you need to have a stronger voice. How can you make a stronger voice? You, uh, you, you sing in a choir. You put all those girls in a choir, and now they sing their happy birthday to you, or whatever, and that carries much further. It's really 
the choir picture is very good because it's a coherent quantum process. It's a, the coherence of the choir is really important. That makes this thing go much further than, uh, than uh, if individual chlorophyll uh, would, would speak up. And so this way you can reach far enough and quickly enough that you get the excitation to the reaction center before the, the electronic excitation dissipates in the molecule. E electronic excitation in the molecule uh, exists for about a nanosecond and then it either flure fluoresces away from the molecule or is turned into vibrational energy of the molecule. One nanosecond is um, not such a long time. So you really must be inventive to do this transfer much faster and uh, so, in fact, the transfer is of the order of about 50 picoseconds or so, so 20 times faster than the dissipation of the excitation in a molecule. And so you can outrun the dissipation, reaching quickly by turning these uh, chlorophylls into little choirs that, uh, that reach much further with their, with their signaling. Okay, so, so that is... Uh, the, the, this part of the story, and now we go to the BC1 complex. So, I give you now an overview. During the, during the next three lectures, then we will go into the detail for every process, not maybe for totally everybody, but we are going there into detail and look at everything again. So, now we are just giving sort of like the, 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 the overview. And now, here we have the BC1 complex. The BC1 complex, they take this molecule quinoles that I mentioned earlier from the, from the um, in my, one of my, my earlier pictures of the reaction series, they take the molecule and, uh, and now they, uh, they turn, the, now the potential that is made in terms of an gradient based on electron diff uh, flow, they turn it into a gradient in terms of a proton flow. And they do that by sending the electrons back and putting protons across the membrane. This is actually um, quite an involved process, though I don't want even try to explain it to you, except one thing. These guys are real con artists. Literally, like almost when, you, when I tell you how they do that, you almost say, my God, I, how could they have sorted it up? And it's almost like cheating. Because they figured out that the energy in the electron gradient is actually so much that you can get of 100% voltage from an electron gradient, you can get 150% voltage for a proton gradient. It sounds unbelievable, but they figured that out. But they have to do a real difficult trick to do that. And that is they have to take the two electrons that reside on the quinole and have to conduct one down and one up. Then they can do it. Why they conduct one in the opposite direction, we will see later. It's really like incredible trick of nature. But um, they have to take the electron and you know when you put a wire into the wall, the electron go along the wire. It's very difficult to make one electron go here and the second electron go there. It's not like once in a while they go there, once in a while they go both there, and once in a while one goes here and one goes there. No, no. The first goes here, the second goes there. Tell that an electrical engineer. No, no way, I, no way inside. So, so that's what they do, really. And that is their trick, getting 150% out of the voltage of an electron uh, gradient is really uh, a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, invention that increases uh, the energy of, of photosynthesis in one, in one step by 50%. Okay, so this is what the BC1 complex do. You now comes the ATP synthase. The ATP synthase it also, this is the one that we have in our body, so this is very relevant for all life forms. They have a, they have a real incredible device. It's a, that actually got me into biophysics as a, as a, young, as a young man. I, 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 I wanted to understand this. And to this day, I don't understand it. But uh, <laughs> I, have a, I have a very, very good postdoc working with Abi, uh, Abhishek and Abhishek uh, 
might make me happy finally at the, at the end, towards the end of my career and, uh, and figure it out with me. That is actually a picture by him. The other pictures are all done by the wonderful uh, uh, co-workers that are in the room, uh, uh, Daniel Chandler and, uh, and Mary Sena and, uh, and Leila um, Vukovic. And so, uh, so they all helped me making these pictures for, for the lecture today. But anyway, how does, this, how does this guy do it? So you have more protons inside of the sphere than out of the sphere. The protons want to leave. They want to escape. And the way they do that is by going through the part of the ATP synthase, here's the ATP synthase, that is in the membrane. And this is actually also a ring, just like this, uh, this uh, chlorophyll protein are ring, but for totally different reason. The only way that the protons can go through is that when a proton goes here, that it goes one time around on, on this ring, and uh, leaves them uh, uh, at another place. So when, the, when here's a ring, proton steps on this carousel, it goes with the carousel, and when it is almost back where it came from, it goes to the top. So it comes from the bottom, goes from the carousel, and goes into the top. That way that the protons drive the carousel around, because the protons want to go up. There is an energy there to make them go up. Now this carousel rotates and it's now glued together with a blue protein that you see here that is then made to rotate. Now uh, if you wouldn't do anything else then the whole, the, the, whole, the whole protein would rotate but you have outside of here a stator that keeps that, that, that top of the protein fixed. So you have fixed and inside you have an axle that goes there. Now the, the axle rotates inside of this, of this system, but the protein cannot rotate because you hold it here. And so you have now the axle rotating. Now this axle is not a, is not an, an, a nice symmetric axle. It is, it is eccentric. So if it would go like this, it would rotate like this, but since it's eccentric, it rotates like this. With other words, it does mechanical work on the top part, just like the way you make a pizza dough. You know, one of these uh, machines, they go there also eccentric when they rotate. So they rotate, thereby they squeeze and expand and squeeze and expand. And this mechanical energy is turned now into chemical synthesis, into the synthesis of ATP. So, I mean, if you would hear you say that's the most cruel thing I've ever heard, it must be a really crazy thing, but all life forms, all life forms on Earth are with, with very few, very primitive life forms don't have it. But, uh, but, uh, but otherwise, you can say almost all life forms have this machine. So really a uh, remarkable thing. So now we, we, we know all the machines. We went through all the steps. You see that we have many components, we have many processes in series that have to work together. That's the point. So it's nice to look at one, and we need to understand them one by one, but we also have to, have to keep the, 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 whole, the whole thing uh, in, in, in mind. And so now here we see sort of like the minimum that is needed for the process. We have here our green proteins that absorb the, 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 the sunlight, turn it into electronic excitation energy. The electronic excitation then turned into coherent excitation excitons. They are the, the, the choir of, of chlorophyll that sinks, and thereby the excitation can jump to the red, between the green and the red, to the blue, the reaction center that conducts electrons through and charges the membrane electronically. The, the, the BC1 complex turns the electronic gradient into proton gradient, and the ATP synthase then turns it into the synthesis of ATP through, through a mechanical process induced by the flow of protons. So that is uh, the process, and that is what we need to understand. Now, before I now go on to the principles, I would like to sort of... Yes, oh please, oh my god, I should have asked many times given you opportunities to ask questions, so please. How, how do the protons get from the red rings to the... Oh, 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 that is the easiest one in the world. Uh, so so from, from here, the, the, 
It's on the quinone, and the quinone, in front of a gatekeeper, had a, had a pass out. So it can diffuse out of the system, okay. and then it diffuses to the thing, and, uh, and there it is being, it being, being worked on. So Daniel Chandler there spent many hours of her life on figuring that out. So, uh, so she loves and hates it because it's a very detailed process, very important. And, but I think we slowly get our hand, hands on it. Okay, so, so those youth, and then the protons, of course, they, they are in water, they conduct very, very quickly in water, and all the proton to get from here to there is no problem. Yes, it goes very quickly. But uh, the quinones have to diffuse, and there's not much lipid in between there. So it's, uh, these, these systems have to be all close together to share the electronic excitation fast. So, they, so the physics dictates that they form a very close aggregate, and the chemistry dictates that they leave enough space for the, for the quinone. So there's a competition that's really typical in biology, that's typical that the engineering side of biology. You have to optimize often disparate a uh, aspects of the overall process. So, okay, so um, I give you, I give you in, in, in a second then opportunities to, to, to ask questions. I should have done it earlier, but let me just quickly finish. So now I just, just would like to give you the composition of the chromatophore. So we have about 100 of these uh, small proteins. We have 20 of these guys. Uh, we have uh, 10 of the yellow guys. And we have one or two uh, of the ATP synthases. And then we have lipid and water and ions. So if you add all the, all the atoms up that are making this one, including the water molecule, the water atoms, lipid atoms, you have 100 million atoms. So it's quite, quite a sizable system. And uh, now if you look at the, at the chemical detail, these are the sort of the components. Uh, the interesting, the proteins are made of many subproteins. None of the proteins are just uh, just uh, one piece. Like for example, the ring protein themselves, they are made of 18 subproteins, of 18 monomers that, that spontaneously assemble. The reason is that uh, that uh, these um, these uh, systems are exposed to radiation and radiation breaks uh, molecules. They constantly need to be repaired. And so now, uh, now let's say you have a car and your wire goes, it would be terrible if, the, if they have to buy a new car, right? It's better have a modular thing, put the wire away, put the new wire in. And so here, <coughs> these, these, these things, these are all the subunits, they are made of many subunits. If something breaks, you take the piece out, put a fresh one in. So it's also very, very smartly organized. So many, many subunits of the proteins. And then here you see the molecules. This is how an ADP looks like, an ATP looks like. Here you see how a quinone looks like, the quinone looks like, and the chlorophyll looks like, the carotenoid looks like, lipids. Uh, I think a lipid was in the prior one. Let me show you quickly how small a lipid is. Here you see a little lipid there. I know, yeah. No, that's, a, that's actually a chlorophyll, but the lipids are about the same size of, of a chlorophyll. So, so these are all the, all the, all the molecules. Okay, so um, now let's summarize. We have an energy conversion system here. And the, and the, uh, the, um, the energy that we convert is initially we have solar energy coming. We turn that into electronic excitation of a single molecule. We turn this into a multi-molecule excitation to an exciton in a ring. That excitation jumps from one ring to the next ring to the next ring to the big ring. So we have this multi-excitation meant several times. Then we have, we, we, we generate inside of the reaction center an electronic voltage, the next energy form. That electronic voltage is then changed in the BC1 complex to proton voltage. And that proton voltage is changed by the uh, ATP uh, synthase into the energy of ATP. So that is, those are the energy forms that we have. 
And those are actually not really the important thing. The real important thing are the processes that realize these, these changes of, of energy transformation. So the first process to turn the energy of so, the solar energy of the, the, the energy of solar radiation into electronic excitation of the molecule is light absorption. So this is the first process. The second process is how we make them from an individually excited molecule a coherently excited group of molecules. That's a formation of an exciton. Then we have to transfer the excitation energy from one ring to the next ring to the next ring that you call excitation energy transfer, which is in fact the same process that Teki Park talked about in the lecture on Tuesday, so where they utilize it in the laboratory. This process is exactly what, what has been utilized by, by nature since more than three billion years. And so this is the next process that we need to understand. Once we have now get the excitation to the reaction center, we utilize it for electron transfer. We have a light-induced or energy-induced electron transfer through the system. That's the next process. Then when we go to the BC1 complex, we have proton transfer. And then we have at the end, at the ATP synthase, mechanically driven chemical synthesis. And these are all quantum processes. So, so here we have a situation where absolutely physics really holds because the understands uh, these, these energy transformations that come about through these processes, we need to invoke quantum physics. And so that is what we need to do now. So I will give you the simplest possible version of it. No need to, 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 to escape immediately. And so I try to make it easy on you, but on the other side, it is real physics. And so uh, we also have to do justice to the, to the subject of physics. So we have a, a beautifully written um, uh, book chapter on this. Uh, here, here we have it uh, that we will be giving to you. Uh, and uh, so the title is The Light Harvesting Apparatus in Purple Photosynthetic Bacteria, Introduction uh, to a Quantum Biological Device. This is um, written for, uh, for sort of like uh, bright undergraduates or, or graduate students. And uh, so it describes here the process and uh, we will make it available on the, on the website. So on the website you will get that that article that really summarizes very nicely this system and uh, you also get, uh, um, uh, get the slides in the PDF file and you can download it from our website and I sent you an, uh, a note uh, I sent you a note um, uh, where you find it on the website. I sent you actually earlier today already the first note uh, about the first homework set and so the first homework set is actually on how to view these systems with a computer program called VMD. And actually all the images you have seen today were made with this program. So you use the same program yourself to look at the molecules. You begin with very simple molecules like water and, uh, and, uh, and ice and, uh, so, and then DNA. So we, it's, it's a slow process. But your first uh, problem set is basically to download uh, the, the program and, uh, and uh, um, to run it on your laptop and to work through the tutorial that comes with that program that uh, teaches you very nicely how to use it. Now the program I told you already has, uh, has uh, several hundred thousand uh, users in the whole world so it's an easy to use program and we train people in it many, many times and I can tell you that, that the work through the tutorial is real fun. It's like learning to drive a car. You know, you feel really empowered. Oh, now I can go really wherever I want and uh, I don't need my parents anymore. And so here you, uh, you have the same feeling of empowerment when you use a program because the program is really real professional software, very intuitive and has a nice user interface. So, so you, it, it is fun, uh, but you need it then for something serious. I am not going to introduce all these molecular details to you, 
that you do through what we call case studies. I mentioned it already briefly on Tuesday. You, uh, you, um, you go then case study by case study with water and ice and, and, and lipids and, and DNA and small protein, medium protein, big protein, uh, also the light harvesting protein is one of the case studies. So, uh, so that way you explore this yourself. It's like, like uh, instead of teaching you European history, and you sit here somewhere in a in an in an uh, in an uh, uh, unair conditioned uh, uh, lecture room classroom in in, in in Illinois, I I pay you the ticket to Europe, and I tell you you first go to Rome, then you go to Athens and then you go to London and to Paris and I tell you look around, open your eyes, maybe go to this and this museum, have fun and then tell me what you learned. And so that is basically learning by looking, that is what this VME problem is doing, rather than learning by tedious memorization and so on. So basically you cannot avoid getting used to biomolecules even if you hate them and don't, uh, don't want to really have anything to do with them. Uh, somehow you, you, you are caught in, the, in partnership with them when you, when you fire up the program. Okay, good. So, um, so now we can uh, ask some, you can ask some questions. And then uh, I will go back to this point and we, I want to now begin uh, um, to, to explain to you how physics can describe these processes. And uh, so we do that very quickly, and then we, uh, then we, work, we talk about the principles of physics that are involved in these processes, and then we, uh, and then we uh, uh, apply them uh, to the biological system here, and also to the, in, to the case of vision. Now, basically you could say that uh, this is a physics class. It differs from other physics classes in, in a simple, in a simple uh, manner, and that is, these processes are um, not taught in normal physics classes because it's sort of old physics, like quantum physics from the 1930s, 1940s, very relevant uh, biomolecules. And so we are not asking ourselves the question, is this of the latest, cheekest physics? Uh, who, who, but rather we say, what do we need to know from physics? What kind of physics has been utilized by evolution? And that physics we are going to learn, and, uh, and that is basically what, what this class offers you, rather than you know, telling you the latest hot story from physics, even though it might be not very relevant for maybe uh, your life or other people's life and so on. Okay, good. So. Uh, Maybe we turn the light on for a while, and you ask questions, and, um, and, uh, and then we continue with, uh, with, with, uh, with, 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 with a more theoretical lecture then. Okay. So let me make sure if I understand this correctly. Um, the BC1 complex, mm -hmm. which is the red guy, like the pimento and the olive of the blue mm -hmm. there, yeah, so, uh, so here, yeah. Well, so, I guess on the, I'm sorry, it's reversed color on the, on the moving thing, it's the red guy. In the yeah, so we, we, we were a little inconsistent here, so we, yeah. uh, uh, so it's a little inconsistent, the color. Um, anyway, yeah. um, and the, in the course of passing along the energy, mm -hmm. the, hydro, the, I, the proton mm -hmm. uh, gets spooted into the middle of that chromatophore, and then um, it just wanders around the inside of the chromatophore yes, until yes. it happens upon the orange guy, which is the ATP synthase. Yeah, that is not uh, really how it goes. Uh, uh, how it really goes is that inside of the chromatophore you have a certain pH, a certain concentration of, of protons given in, in units of 10 to, 10 to the minus of pH and, 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 uh, and uh, exponent. And so now you have there are zillions of protons that are hopping from water molecule to water molecule to water molecule. And, uh, and now you're just adding to that pool through pumping. So, so, so basically you have, uh, you have inside, you have pair square, uh, square angstrom, 
uh, let's say per square nanometer, per cubic nanometer, you have 10 protons. I just make up the number now. I don't want to do the calculation quickly, the real calculation. Outside, you might have only one per square, per cubic uh, uh, nanometer. And so the inside, they are much more than outside, so they want to get out. But they are, they are pushing against the ATP synthetic all the time. So you're not dealing with, uh, with individual uh, uh, protons, but you, you, you have a pool of them. It's the same with the quinone, by the way. The quinone that moves around, you also have a pool of them, like 30 to 50. And now you're just putting two protons, two electrons on one of them, then you have a few more of those. And when, when one of those guys gets close to them, it's being used up, and then you refresh it after a while. So you work with pools. Well, that was actually my next question with the queen on. Um, you made it sound like have, for the queen on to do their thing, they had mm. to have a certain surface area of lipid to work on. So they walk mm. across the lipid. Or? No, they walk. They walk so they swim through the lipid. They have a long tail that is just like uh, looks like a lipid. So they have a head. The lipid has a small charged head or neutral head, sort of polar that loves water. The queen holes have a have a different kind of head that looks like almost like a benzene molecule with two sticks on the side. And, uh, and they have a tail, however, that just looks like a lipid. So they just go with the lipids. When you don't look carefully, you think you might you think, oh, that's a lipid there, but it's really a quinol. And so they, they, they move around. But they have to physically go through. And again, nature uses here the trick that it always works with pools of them. So there's always one ready to do, the, uh, do it fast. You don't have to go all the way. Uh, just like when you do, uh, when you have a battery or when you have any electronic process. You know, if, you, if you ask yourself, you have an iron battery, how long does it take an iron to go from one electrode to the next one? It's an hour. But you have immediately a, a current coming out because there are so many ions uh, in, the, in that, uh, in that uh, uh, battery that there's an immediate fresh one waiting and then it being replaced by another one on the other electrode. Okay. Yes, that is exactly what my physics lecture is about. So there we really have to go into the lecture. But I can tell you very quickly that the, that the ability of a molecule to absorb light is uh, described by a vector, by a little vector, which is called the transition dipole moment. And that transition dipole moment makes a scalar product with the polarization of the, of the light. It's also a vector, unit vector. And if they are very well aligned, then you can absorb the light very well. And now light that comes uh, to these uh, uh, habitats, so these bacteria come from all directions. It's not particularly polarized. So all three polarization directions, x, y, z, are equally likely. So now you want to have molecules that have an equal number of x-oriented, y-oriented, and z-oriented. Uh, uh, once. Now nature is very smart. It doesn't make now 9x, 9y, and 9z because it realizes that if, uh, as long as I have all directions, the xy direction represented eight, uh, uh, 18 times, it's as good as if I have 9 in one and 9 in the other. Uh, but in the z direction, it puts them all uh, in the z direction because when you look at the structure, the structure was actually solved here in my group at the, at the University of Illinois, uh, you see that it's much harder to put an, 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 a chlorophyll parallel than, than perpendicular. So chemically it's much harder. So nature to really find a good trick. And so it just did it. It could only find one trick to do it. So they all go like this. Um, but all together now you have you have uh, uh, you know, 9 plus 9 plus 9 chlorophyll. That means that, that they absorb light from any direction. And that's, of course, very good. So you had a question, then you? Um, yes, yeah, so how uh, greatly does the pH inside of the cell fluctuate um, as it's Actually, uh, it's uh, the, we talk a big numbers game. It's like it's uh, uh, it's at the level of a chromatophore. It's almost textbook thermodynamics. 
a protein already obeys what you read in the feminine textbook, even though it's finite, but it, uh, the, it has a distributed, the, the, the state variables are dis Gaussian distributed often, average obeys uh, the statistical mechanic very well. But if you go to the chromatophore, then you have a certain concentration, and you can f basically forget about the fluctuation. Mm -hmm. So you? So for the bacteria, um, the direction of the incoming line is mm -hmm. uh, unpredictable. But I guess for the plants, it's for what for? The direction of the incoming yeah. light. Mm -hmm. For the plants. No, the direction is not important, the polarization. Oh, yeah, the, polar oh. yeah, the direction of the polarization is always perpendicular to the direction oh. of the light. Yeah. And the polarization that counts how, how light actually interacts with, uh, with a molecule, not the direction from where it comes. So, so for the plants, I guess, it can eliminate one of the dimensions because mm -hmm. the light is almost always coming from a certain angle. No, 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 no. The, 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 the direction from where the light comes, of course, you yeah, know, like, like if, uh, uh, it might well be that, no, probably not because, 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 uh, because uh, the cell, so now you'd say, oh, the light comes always from there, it's always pull in a certain direction. That's true. But now you have to be the engineer, not the physicist. And of course, we all, we all want to be good physicists. But the cell is going any direction. So we have all, even if the light would only come straight down, the cell is rotated in any direction. So the, the cell sees isotopically distributed light. OK. And, and, um, I missed the part where you said some, some process takes in time order of femtoseconds, what, what was the process? So that is a process where um, where a carotenoid takes a 500 nanometer photon, and gets electronically excited, and then it gives the excitation to a chlorophyll, either this one or that one, within 100 femtoseconds. So it's a very, very fast process. Mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 in the next slide, yes. So the same carotenoid pigment uh, absorbs in the 500 nanometer range and in the Yes, because, because uh, these systems have many electrons, so they have many modes by which the electrons can absorb light. And so they have one mode that is called the QY transition, that is the lowest energy excitation. Then they have one that is called the QX transition here, that is a higher energy uh, excitation. And then they have the Soreban band, which is another excitation. So then if you go higher, they have as many excitations as they have electrons. But then many of them already ionizing. If you go one of the high excitations, the electron flies out of the molecule in no time. So these are the low energy excitations that, uh, that keep the molecule intact. But uh, if you have a system of, uh, of n electrons, you have n excitations. OK. So you said that the picture on the right hand up, up, right up is mm -hmm. uh, a size of a structure that's only 200 angstroms. Mm -hmm. How do you make that? So you do that with what is called iron beam milling. So you are, so you you slice. So in the old days you slice cell with a microtome with a very very sharp knife. Today it's also a knife, but then, then it's a knife made of an iron beam. So you go with an iron beam. And then you move a little bit, and you go again, and move again. And, then, and every time you, you get a slice, you move it, you put it on a little griddle, and move it somewhere, and then you do it again. It's the same um, uh, techni technology that is used here, for example, in our um, micro and nano uh, electronics laboratory. They have a clean room where they use also uh, iron uh, beam milling. So it's a, 
today not quite so modern in any technology anymore, but it's a, still a very advanced modern technology in, in, in electronics and in solid state physics. But it, you use nowadays right away in biology because the biologists are very sophisticated users of technology because they are you know, very well funded. Uh, they have you know big centers where they have really experts working with them. So you find today accelerator technology is the best laser technology. They're the first free electron lasers that uh, X-ray electron lasers that they are going to build. And so uh, when you want to see high tech today, you go to physics department or you go to biology department. Mm -hmm. And it's not even clear where you find what the better technology because money makes the world go around. Okay, so okay, so I don't have much time anymore, but uh, enough time that I can at least sketch what I'm going to do. So I do, can we maybe turn the light completely on? Um, so I do two things to you. Something very nice, I give you a brilliant lecture next time. And something nasty, but hopefully not too nasty. I, um, I give you uh, uh, the notes that have the key results. I cannot teach uh, the, the whole subject really. Uh, my quantum mechanics notes, I taught you many times the quantum, uh, the graduate quantum course. So I have notes on this, on this course. And in there is chapter eight that, that deals with interaction of light and, and, and charged particles. And there we will need key formulas. Which formulas you need will become very clear from the, from the uh, class, from my lecture. And we will also give you notes that tell you which formulas you have to look at. And so then you can read the notes. You might also just look at the formulas and remember what they mean. Uh, but you can also read the whole derivation. And you can even look at the whole quantum notes where when certain concepts of quantum physics are used, you can, you can read it there. So we have then basically several pathways. The, the real eager physicists who read the derivation of the uh, interaction of, of, of radiation with, with charged particles, in this case the electrons in the molecule. We have, uh, uh, and even goes back to all the quantum physics uh, background, we have the not so eager physicists to read the derivation, but when there is utilized an equation from another chapter, no, no, I don't go there. And then we have the, the lady physicist who said, ah, I just want to know the formula that I need. Don't bother me with the rest. I try to understand what they mean. And uh, I'm well equipped to describe the phenomena. And all three people will get good homework set scores, all fine. It's of course that in, in, uh, in physics, we like to give you the, the um, we like to derive things, but I cannot do that, unfortunately. I did it in in past, but now that I share the course, and I have only sort of half the course, uh, with uh, the other half is uh, more experimentally oriented, uh, uh, I cannot derive the, the uh, material really at any level, and so then I better tell you, look it up yourself. I just give you sort of the principle. Okay, and so the principle is uh, very easily said that we have, uh, we have uh, we have we have two two things. We have here the sun. That is not part of our system. Then we have here the radiation field where the radiation goes from the sun to the universe uh, uh, all the way to, uh, down to Earth. And uh, so this is a radiation field. And then here we have the molecule made up of positive and negative charges, where the positive charges are, are slow and heavy, and they don't absorb um, uh, optical radiation. So here we have uh, a filter in the, in the atmosphere 
and the filter, the atmosphere filters out radiation except uh, between 500 and 800 nanometer, that radiation makes it to the, to the surface of the Earth and is utilized by biological life forms. The other one is basically absorbed too much and the uh, life forms don't bother with, with that radiation. And so these guys absorb only radar uh, radiation, so they don't play a role. They, they could play a role if you do radiation, microwave radiation. Oh, then we have to deal with a, with a heavier uh, a nuclei in the molecule. But here we need to only deal with the, with the electrons. They are capable of absorbing this one. So here we have then the molecule. And now we have a problem, and the problem is that uh, we have the Maxwell equation that describes the radiator, uh, that describes um, electromagnetic uh, phenomena, but we have here one time the Coulomb interaction we have one time the Coulomb interaction in the molecule. Then we know, we know when we have the Coulomb interaction, we can describe the molecule. No radiation field. And then on the other side, we, we took a course in electromagnetism where we described the radiation field. But here we have these things together. So this comes and this comes. And so now we have to formulate the, the description of the electromagnetic field in such a way that we are getting um, the following theory. We have uh, the physics of the radiation field. So so how does this look like? And we just take the simplest form, so it will be very easy actually. Then we have the physics of molecules governed by, by governed by Coulomb interaction. And if we had this one, that would be that would be no good because we have the radiation field and the molecule, they wouldn't see each other. We have to we need to get an interaction between them, and that is we need a perturbation between the two. So this is what we need to need to do. So it's a, that is sort of like our intellectual problem. So electro Maxwell equation hold for both of them, but now we must solve it in such a form that we are getting one description for the radiation field, one for the molecules, the way we know it already, but there must be a rest there that, that, that leaves then a term that couples the two, and that is actually very, that is the essential part to understand how the radiation field interacts with the molecule. Okay, and that is what we will be doing the next time. So then let me just say that uh, I, you should get, you should, if you gave us our name, so oh, that's it now, a quickly technical comment about the, the website again. Uh, we, we gave you, uh, you gave us your name and email address. We, uh, we in, sent you back an invitation to join the class website. If you got this, fine. If you didn't get it, then uh, maybe just right now immediately talk to the, to the TAs so that they write your name down again so that you are getting access to the website. Because on the website we put material. Today, to be nice, I copied the problem set. So there are some more copies there. So that today's copy, uh, problem set is there. It's also on the website. But uh, the, the class notes, the, the, the copies of my slides, they're only on the website. And so uh, that you, I, I, I don't want to print out, it kills too many trees, so you have to get download it yourself.
And so if you don't, didn't get there, then quickly make sure that you get it so that you can participate fully. Okay, thank you.